forward. And then I will share my screen uh, and talk about uh, the orchid, uh, which is going to be uh, the biggest uh, plant family of uh, them all. And uh, we've already seen some orchids in class, uh, so you should already be at least know some of the plants. Uh, so welcome to Horticulture, uh, Tropical Plant ID, talking all about orchids. Uh, so Trader Joe's. Trader Joe's did a very good job in marketing. Uh, the moth orchid that we'll get to see later on. So you have some of the moth orchids that if you need a gift, uh, Trader Joe's is the place to be. Not that uh, I am uh, endorsing uh, that company, but to buy an orchid for 10, 12, 14 dollars, it's going to be very, very inexpensive. Uh, so they have done a good job. And now when anybody thinks about uh, some of these moth orchids, uh, they're going to think about Trader Joe's. Uh, so they've done the right thing in marketing this uh, nice plant. So when we look at the Orchidiaceae or the orchid family, it's going to be gigantic. So the biggest plant family is going to be the orchids and they're, they're also going to be some of the more advanced in the plant family groups. Uh, so orchid family distributed to, uh, throughout the world. Uh, obviously, the biggest distribution is going to be in the tropics, but you also find them in California and uh, only in some very, very hot climates. Uh, you might not find them, or at least we may not uh, have found any yet. Uh, we may find them later on. So it's the monocot, uh, again, grass like leaves, uh, 880 genera. We are not going to touch, uh, go in anywhere near uh, the orchids that are out there. Uh, and over 20,000 species and over 100,000 hybrids, uh, which makes it a gigantic group of plants. Uh, so orchids. Uh, and uh, here is just uh, the lineage, <laughs> uh, the family tree uh, of the different groups uh, of the uh, plants. Uh, so we have some of the different families or the orders. Uh, and uh, we have uh, the asparagus uh, or the asparagus that we've seen before. Uh, our, so when we look a little bit closely into those asparagales, which is going to be uh, the order, uh, we're going to find uh, a few of its closer relatives. So the orchids are going to be way out here on top. And so we have uh, Ipoxidiaceae, a different family group and a few of the other related monocots that, again, they came from one ancestor and then eventually they branched and they became their own. Uh, so there's the orchid. And uh, here's the Apoxidiaceae, uh, Hypoxidiaceae. Uh, so this is gonna be a group of uh, tiny flowering. And so they're saying this is gonna be one of the closer uh, real relatives of the orchids. So they don't look anything like orchids. So they probably the ancestor of the orchid may have been like this. Uh, and as time went by, as the orchid specialized, they changed dramatically. And now they have uh, their own different parts. So uh, here's uh, some of the closer relatives of the orchids. And I've grown them for a while. I think I might still have a few that are alive. Uh, but here's another one where the flower cluster is, uh, or the flowers are producing a cluster. So a sister to orchid and a closely related sister uh, to them. Uh, but orchids are going to look very different to people. Some people say may, they might look like a dragon, others say it might look like a face. Uh, depending on who you speak with, they have a different notion of what an orchid may, may look like. Uh, here are some of the smallest orchid. So the big flowers that you see in the store, those are just a few selected hybrids that have big flowers. And of course they have a value for horticulture and a value for uh, gifts. However, most or the majority of orchid that you are gonna find in the wild are gonna be very, very tiny. Uh, if not the plant, here's my finger for scale. Here's the entire orchid body. Uh, but maybe the flower here I am holding between my thumb and my index finger to show you the very small size of the flower and also the fruit. 
So most of these miniature orchids are not gonna have a real value for ornamental purposes, but they are gonna be sought after by collectors. The people, the orchid geeks that go out of their way to collect orchids, they're gonna go bonkers and they're gonna go buy uh, some of these plants for a lot of money because they are gonna be a little bit difficult to come up around. All of the orchids are gonna be on the side east uh, red list, which means that if you go travel somewhere, you cannot collect orchids from the wild. And that was a protection uh, for the plant because many plants have a very narrow distribution. They're only found on the side of a mountain, maybe a couple of meters wide, and that's it. And uh, when there was a lot of people that would start collecting them, they would go into Mexico, Central South America, and they would pillage uh, entire populations and they would then take them uh, out of there and uh, many of them turned out to be new species and they were now extirpated from the wild. So that is why it became necessary to put them on a list uh, that puts them under protection so that nobody is goes uh, to the natural areas and harvest them. Uh, if they're from uh, a nursery, if they're cultivated or produced through humans, it's a different story. But wild collector orchids, please do not collect them or you're gonna get in trouble if they happen to get caught. Uh, and here's a, a different one, uh, very, very small. Uh, you can see my thumb. Uh, here's uh, one that is growing on that uh, fern uh, stem or uh, the fern, uh, uh, tree fern uh, stem. Uh, so this one looks almost like grass uh, and that's going to be the flowers. So when we are going to be looking at orchids, uh, there's going to be different categories. Uh, the first one is going to be the terrestrial orchids. Obviously, these are the ones that are going to grow out of the ground. Uh, so here is a species that I found in Brazil. And do not ask me for the name because there's so many that I haven't even started uh, trying to ID all the different wild forms. And most often when you ask people like you, orchids uh, are a little bit difficult, but they grow in, uh, in underground. And then there's gonna be the epiphyte or the epiphytic orchids, like the one we saw uh, in class where they are going to grow on trees. Uh, so they're just gonna be catching a ride uh, they're going to use the roots uh, to hold themselves onto the bark or whatever little groove uh, the bark of the tree may hold. And so here is uh, the example of an epiphytic orchid. Uh, here's just some, one of the bigger uh, orchids, uh, terrestrial orchids. This is the bamboo orchid, as it's sometimes referred to. Uh, and uh, here's a flower. And uh, here's uh, one right in the wild. You can see it coming out of the foliage, the leaves are somewhere at the bottom. And uh, here's uh, this one uh, going in the wild. Or on the side of the road, uh, here is that orchid in red. Uh, and this happens to be an epidendrum uh, type uh, right there. Uh, here is uh, the brassabola, uh, or uh, kind of like a night blooming moth pollinated orchid. This one is in Brazil. Uh, sorry, this is Argentina. Uh, here it is growing. And so when we are going to be talking about orchids, they're going to be weird and they want to have their own different body parts. So for the orchid, when we are referring to a stem, uh, we are going to use the word pseudobulb. So all orchids are going to have pseudobulbs. The pseudobulbs are going to change. Uh, and uh, sometimes it may look like a cane. Sometimes it just might be little flat things. But it's gonna be a pseudobulb and that's gonna be a unique structure on the orchid. And so when we look at many of the orchids, most of the ones that you are gonna be getting from the store are gonna be monocarpic. That means they're gonna flower only once. And so what we have here is uh, different, three different uh, age on the pseudobulb. We have the brand new one here uh, that will probably flower this year. We have the eye or the growing bud that will give me the next pseudobulb. We have the mother pseudobulb, that would be the daughter. Uh, that's gonna be last year. And then we have the grandma pseudobulb that you see all wrinkle. Uh, that's gonna be about three years uh, ago. 
And so in most cases, most people will just tend to have this trio, the grandma, the mom, and the daughter. And that ensures that there's enough suitables with energy for them to produce flowers and continue on with the plant. So most of the growing shoots or the stem will come out of an eye that would be somewhere at the bottom or at the base uh, of this. And uh, you can see the plant is growing on the bark, which is mimicking uh, that epiphytic growing on a tree. Uh, and so when we have different plants, different orchids, the pseudobulbs are gonna change. Uh, we mentioned with your dendrobium orchid here, we have a cane-like, uh, so that's gonna be the pseudostem. The pseudostem plays a role in absorbing water, sorry, uh, storing water, storing vitamins, minerals, energy, and everything else the plant needs to grow. Uh, and so that's why they're not really a true bulb, but there's a pseudo or a false bulb uh, item of the orchid because they may have to store a lot of water if they happen to be on the top of a tree and they might not get rain in a couple of days. So they have to be able to store it. Uh, and this other orchid here, you can see almost a pear-like or pear-shaped uh, pseudobulb with the leaves, uh, the old one that flowered last year and the new one that is flowering, currently flowering. Uh, and uh, even this one, this is the vanilla orchid. Uh, it is a climber, so there will be orchids that will climb. Uh, and uh, it's gonna climb by wrapping its leaves, sorry, its uh, roots on two trees. And so this stem that is kind of swollen, that would be the pseudo stem for the vanilla orchid or the vanilla bean plant. Uh, and uh, sometimes there's gonna be a monopodial orchid, meaning one single foot. And that's gonna be that moth orchid that only has one. Eventually, as time goes by, there may be some lateral creating a clump. Uh, but it's not going to have any kind of stem or cane. It's just going to be one shoot coming out of the uh, container. So there's going to be monopodium one foot. Uh, what's also unique with orchids is that they are going to have valem, and that is going to be the spongy material that you will see on the orchid roots. And so the picture on top is showing you the brand new roots as they are growing and clinging onto the pod and behind it, you see the white spongy material. That is the uh, valem. And you can see it here and you can see here where I'm holding it. Uh, the valem is going to have a very important role and that is that it's going to catch the water. So when the rain hits, it may come for maybe a few minutes in the tropics, that's normally the time, and then it goes away. Uh, and so, by absorbing the water very quickly, then the plant is able to drink it a little bit slower later on, but it is able to hold the water. And so having healthy roots on, uh, those, uh, on some of those epiphytic uh, orchids is very, very important. So the roots should always be kind of white, and that is because it's gonna have that healthy valem. If they look kind of brownish like the ones in the back, when they are too soggy, too wet, or not kept in a good condition, then the roots and the venom dies, and then the plant is going to be suffering. So this is a structure that is important for the orchids that grow on top of the trees because they're able to grab the water very, very quickly. And here's a very long roots. This is normal for many of the orchids. So when they get showered, uh, the water is going to run through the roots and they're going to be absorbing the water as it's going through, later using it for their biological functions. And if we start to look at how and possibly how some of the orchids may have evolved, uh, here we have just a simple amaryllis. It is related uh, far, uh, far away uh, as a uh, relative. So we have once again uh, something very similar that we saw with the injured, uh, gingers. We have the T-poles, and I mentioned know that word because we are gonna use it many, many times. So just like the gingers, we saw uh, a dorsal tipple uh, and the inner tipple. And then we have uh, two lateral tipples here and uh, one that may form some kind of lip, not yet in this uh, amaryllis. And then we have uh, the male and the female component of the flower, uh, the stigma and the uh, stamens that are gonna be separate. 
Uh, they're going to be separate, but they're going to be together because that ensures that the bee will, or the animal somehow is going to come in contact with the reproductive structures, delivering the pollen. So the tipos are going to be separate from one another. Uh, the reproductive structures are going to be separate from one another. So here is more of a simplistic flower for a monocot, and probably the ancestor of the orchid may not look similar or may have a hat. Uh, some similar, similar features. And then if we look at the ginger, now we are seeing something very different. Uh, if you remember, now we have more of a specialization uh, with uh, the ginger. Now we have the actual inner and uh, lateral tipos are going to be kind of gone, not really useful. And uh, the showy component will be the stamens that will become kind of petal like but where it really started to become specialized is going to be the reproductive structure that has the stigma kind of connected to the stamen and then it has some kind of column or some kind of other structure uh, that is holding the two of them together so it's almost looked like a one unit so that has now become specialized only one stamen that is functional the others are just going to be petal like uh, and so I've shown you this picture before. So here is the reproductive structure. So there's a stigma. Here's the anther uh, with the filament behind here. And then uh, that's where the pollen is. And so the stigma is kind of embedded within uh, the anther and uh, sorry, the filament. And then the anther is going to have the pollen. So a little bit more specialized uh, for the gingers. Uh, however, when you see the ginger like this, uh, it's upside down. Uh, the ginger should actually be like this uh, if we were to put it right side up. So somehow the gingers are really weird and they have decided to flip the flowers. And so now if we turn it the right way, now we're going to have the lip, the lip that is going to serve as a landing platform. And then the rest are going to be the showy portion. And so Perhaps this was the next steps that the orchids had to take, something like this where they created a landing platform uh, where they may have then eventually evolved into having very unique flowers. So perhaps something like this, this change that kind of occur uh, with the gingers. Because when we look at the orchids, they may look very similar to a ginger. Here is on your left, the shell ginger that we've seen or talked about in class. And here it is with an orchid, side by side to an orchid. So both of them have a landing platform, a lip, uh, same thing with the orchid. Uh, and then the tipos are going to be back here, which in the orchids are going to be very showy. Uh, the reproductive components here separate in your gingers have now become fused in a single unit with orchids. So they have taken that extra leap into now they modifying even more the reproductive structure. So now if we look at that evolution, then we got the orchids. And so when we look at the orchids, uh, we have the dorsal tepals, the lateral tepals like we saw, saw before. We have inner tepals and then we have one that forms the lip. And the reproductive structure is now going to be known as a column, and that is going to be a unique item with orchids. So it's a gynostinium because it is the stamen and the stigma and the anthers and the filaments all together into a single unit. So gynostinium as the uh, real name or column as a common name that most people will know it by. And then if we rip the flower open and apart, this is what we are going to find. We have the lateral tepals, we have the lip, and then here is the column. Uh, the column that is going to be the reproductive component. And now if we magnify the column, this is where the orchids are going to be very, very different. Uh, instead of having stamens, uh, the orchids have now have what is known as a pollinia, which are going to be the pollen that is going to be given in a packet. No longer are the bees going to be dusted by a bunch of pollen and wasting a lot. It's going to be packed into small compartments 
and deliver as a package to the next or uh, to the next orchid. And so we have the column. Uh, we have a nectar spur that may be long with some orchids, and we'll see examples later on because they still have to offer uh, a reward for the pollinator or a payment. And then uh, there's going to be the cavity that is going to be very shiny. That is the stigma. That is where the pollen needs to be deposited by the bee, the butterfly, the moth, whatever is going to be the pollinator of the specific orchid. And the anther is going to have a cap. So the first job of the pollinator is to remove the cap and somehow take the pollen sack and deliver it, or the pollen package, uh, package of pollen and deliver it to the next flower. And so when we look at what needs to happen in order for pollination to occur, uh, my finger is acting as an insect or a pollinator. So the pollinator is going to go deep into the flower and uh, take the nectar. In the process, uh, the pollen cap is going to probably fall off or break off. Uh, the orchid has enough time, just a few seconds, to stick the pollen sacs or the pollen, a package of pollen onto the back of the insect, the side of the insect, wherever they need to be bringing into contact with the pollinator. And so here I pull in my finger, so as the insect backs away from the flower, it will then begin to carry the pollen sacs or the pollen packages, that is the pollinia for the orchids. Uh, and then those, you can see the glue on the bottom uh, and the pollen sacs. As the orchid visits and repeats this step, uh, when it backs away, it will then deposit the pollinia uh, or the pollen uh, packages of pollen onto the stigmatic receptacle of the orchid, and that brings pollination. Very sophisticated, it is very precise. And because of this precision in pollination is what kind of brings the orchid into the next level of evolution, making them the most advanced plants that we know, or they are considered the most advanced plants. Uh, and so that's the area where the pollens used to be, and there's the cap. And so very unique. And uh, when you're looking at pollination, uh, the packet uh, is going to be placed on the different parts of the bee, obviously not my photographs. Uh, but you can see here a bee that has the pollen, uh, the pollinia uh, on its face. You can see here uh, this uh, bee, uh, emerald green bee. Uh, that has a pollinia, one on its uh, thorax and one kind of on its abdomen. So different orchids are going to deposit or glue uh, the pollinia on different parts of the body, different sides of the body, underneath, on the side, on the leg, left leg, right leg. And so by doing so, they ensure that the pollen is delivered to the right flower because that is kind of where the location of the stigmatic receptacle is going to be held. And so that's how it worked for the orchids. And that's how they diversify like there was no tomorrow because they build this very unique relationship with specific insects or specific pollinators. Uh, there are gonna be other uh, types of pollination, uh, but here's the process. Uh, uh, this is uh, the hammer orchid. Uh, so a bee has to land, uh, probably take the nectar in the process the orchid is going to put the pollen in the back of the insect. And so the insect will then fly off. And in the process of visiting a different flower, it's going to uh, take the pollen from this second orchid and deliver the pollen from the first. So this process gets repeated every single time an orchid gets pollinated. Uh, and so here are different types of insects. So we have beetles that pollen sacs, pollen pollinia is placed on their head. Here's uh, a cockroach uh, on its thorax. Here's some of the bees that you can see uh, maybe on its legs. And here's a, a different bee that it's on the rear end uh, uh, of the abdomen. Uh, and here's uh, a hawk moth. And you can see the pollen sacs right here on its proboscis or in its mouth. Uh, and then here's uh, some of the spurs. So for the hawk moth here, it has a very long 
a narrow or thin straw-like mouth part known as a proboscis. And so when you see some of these orchids, uh, you can then figure that it has to be pollinated by a butterfly or a moth if, they have, uh, if they're nocturnal and the fragrance is kind of like perfume and uh, comes out during the night, then definitely that may is going to be a moth. And so there has to be a moth that is going to have to put its proboscis through the flower and it has to reach the base of that nectary uh, or the spur and that's where the nectar is going to be found. And so this was some of the earliest work uh, with uh, Charles Darwin that he found several orchids, uh, especially one in Madagascar that had a very, very long spur. And uh, he concluded that there was and there had to be an insect that would pollinate it. Uh, here, uh, here's the flower. So this is where uh, the insect would land and uh, eat, uh, get the proboscis. And so not this one, uh, but this is a hawk moth. This one is from South America that I, I happen to find. And you can see the proboscis or the mouth part being coiled. Uh, and uh, when I cut it and I began to extend it, here you can see the tip of the pen. That is uh, me as I am unfurling uh, the mouth part. So here it starts the mouth part here and it still has maybe a few more turns. So it's even longer than this. So this is uh, a good 10 inches, maybe even longer. Uh, so that is the length of the mouth part of this uh, hawk moth. And so Darwin was right. Uh, I believe he never got a chance to really see uh, the moth, but later on uh, there has been evidence and video of the moth visiting that orchid that Darwin predicted that had to have a very unique pollinator with a very, very long mouth. And that was one of his hawk moths. Uh, so one-to-one -one relationship, one-to-one -one specialization between an orchid and an insect is found on many of them. Uh, and here's uh, the hawk moth as an example. Uh, there's gonna be a few other orchids like the slipper orchids that are going to uh, attract flies or some kind of flies. So here's a uh, hover fly with the pollinia, the pollen sac on its face or on the top. Same thing here and a few other fruit flies uh, that will also become good pollinators. And so here is a very long mouth fly and uh, again, obviously not my slide, uh, but you can see the relationship between the length of the mouth of the fly and the shape and the form and the length of the orchid right here. Uh, so it's a one-to-one -one relationship. So the fly and the orchids have evolved together and they now depend on one another. And the fly might be the only true pollinator of this orchid, the only one that is able to deliver the pollen uh, correctly. Uh, so, and then there's gonna be a different group of orchids that are going to use sex. Uh, to attract a male bees. These are going to be called uh, bee orchids and they're going to use what is known as pseudo copulation. Uh, so the bee orchids, uh, many of them are native to Australia, others, uh, that's a hummer orchid right here, and or uh, Ophrys, the genus Ophrys, which is native to Europe and the Mediterranean. The flowers may look like a female bee, or at least uh, to the male bee it will, but they will also secrete a pheromone, a perfume that is going to be exactly like the female uh, wasp or the female bee will, would uh, ex uh, exude so that it can attract the pollinate, uh, the mate. Uh, and so in the process of looking like a female bee, a male wasp being dumb, uh, it's going to try to copulate mate with the flower. It's going to then take the pollen sac and in the process of looking for a female, he may come across another flower, try to mate with it again and deliver the pollen. And so there is no real reward for the bee in this case of the pollen, it is just they are being made fools thinking that their reward is mating with a female uh, of its species. So pseudo copulation, um, pretending that they're female bees, wasp, uh, is found on many orchids. And this is, uh, so this is uh, Ophrys epiphora, 
Uh, here I took this photograph uh, when it was presented at the Southern California Horticultural Society. Uh, so they will grow here, they're Mediterranean. Uh, the secret is that they have to go bone dry during the summer. And I've been looking for them, but very few people offer them. Uh, and so when pollination and very complex uh, is achieved, then you have the production of the fruit and the seed. And so the ovary of the flower will be somewhere in the back. And you can see here where I cut it and you see the compartment uh, with the ovules that will become the seeds later on. And then uh, the fruit will then begin to swell. The flower parts are gonna be gone. That's the remnants of the tepals and everything else. And so now you have the fruit that is gonna be some kind of dry uh, capsule uh, that will then release a lot of seeds. Uh, the orchids are gonna be some of the more horrible parents uh, or the worst parents in uh, the plant kingdom uh, because their seeds have no energy reserve. Uh, so there's just an embryo uh, that is, needs to germinate as soon as possible. And so there's nothing for them to eat. They don't put, them, uh, put their child, children with any kind of provision. So they are very, very bad parents. Uh, the moment the seeds uh, are ready, they're gonna fly, hopefully land in a crack of a tree and that's where they're gonna germinate. So here are the orchid seeds, very tiny, almost dust-like because they're gonna have to fly. And so the only way that the seed is able to survive is that it immediately needs to make a relationship with a fungi, a mycorrhiza fungi. So mycorrhiza fungi are beneficial fungi that live in the substrate, that live in the soil, that live on the bark of trees, they live throughout the area. And so when the seed lands in close proximity with the fungi, the fungi will begin to infect the seed. And uh, by infecting the seed, uh, the fungi will feed uh, the baby orchid the energy that it needs to germinate. And so in the process, it first looks like the fungi may be taking advantage, maybe parasitizing or maybe killing the orchid. Uh, but then as the orchid grow and becomes established, then it will repay the fungi with uh, carbohydrates for helping it out in the beginning. And then from there on, they will build this relationship where the fungi and the orchid are gonna live together, helping each other out. And so this is a very important part of the orchid life that without that fungi, if the seed never happens to find that fungi or does not land in close proximity where there's a fungi, this mycorrhiza fungi, the seed will start to death or the seedling will start to death and it will never germinate. And that is why many people will grow orchids. They'll have the seed pods. They put the seeds in some kind of soil but the mycorrhiza is not there, so they never germinate it. Uh, most often, seeds are going to have to be germinated in a test tube, in a lab, in a flask that has sugar. It has all the vitamins and minerals that the baby seed uh, or the orchid seed needs to germinate and to grow. And that's how we have gone around it uh, by growing in a, in a test tube. And that's going to be the picture right here. So seeds can be placed in an agar solution, uh, gelatin to kind of hold them, keep them from sinking, and the seeds will germinate. And the techniques of uh, tissue culture started with orchid collectors. So they're the orchid geeks that wanted orchids and they wanted to mass produce them. And uh, they're the ones who started to experiment with the different uh, uh, tissue culture techniques, and eventually they got adopted by the rest of the horticulture industry. So this is how uh, ideally you can germinate orchids if you wanted to uh, or not. Or many orchids are gonna produce offshoots. Uh, the word kiki, which means children or child in Hawaiian, uh, are baby orchids that are gonna be appearing. So here is uh, the dendrobium orchid and you see the all flower spike. And out of that, you have uh, a baby plant or several of them. So you can take uh, that baby plant and you can plant it and voila. And then there's gonna be a few other weird things about orchids. So here is 
an orchid and it has a very nasty predator. It's called a mantis orchid. So other things evolve with orchids. Uh, the mantis orchid is going to look very similar uh, to the flower, almost the same color. And so the mantis is going to wait patiently until there's a pollinator. They can even grab a hummingbird if it needs to. And when the pollinator decides to visit the flower or maybe see coming close proximity with the mantis because he doesn't see it, uh, then it's going to be eaten. Uh, and uh, not too long ago, a uh, student of mine was raising some of them. You can get them through some of the more specialized pet shops. Uh, but here's a baby mantis orchid. Uh, that I was able to photograph. I've never seen them in the wild, but they're out there. So this is a different organisms that evolve with the different orchids that are out there. And there's a side view of a cutesy baby uh, mantis orchid. Uh, there's uh, Stanopia, no, Corianthes, not Stanopia, Corianthes. Uh, this is the bucket orchid. Uh, there's a very, very nice uh, movie about pollination that I'm, I maybe place it on the video so you can watch it because it's very, very nice. That shows the pollination of this uh, orchid. Uh, so uh, it's going to use bees uh, and it's going to, the bee, a stupid bee has to land inside the bucket and it's uh, only way out is to come in contact with the reproductive components of the plant. Uh, the title of the movie, uh, Sexual Encounters of the Floral Kind, I'll put a link because I think the full movie is uh, on YouTube, so I'll put a link later on. Uh, but most important, the only orchid that we actually eat, not the only one, one of the few orchids that we actually eat, uh, vanilla orchid. Uh, the vanilla bean comes from the fruit of an orchid. Uh, vanilla bean here is uh, the flower. Uh, we, you've probably seen it. We have it in the greenhouse. We had it for years uh, and it has flower. Uh, we don't have the natural pollinator here. That bee that will do the job is not found in California or anywhere else in the world. It's native to um, South America and there are many, many vanilla plants out there. It's only vanilla planifolia, the one that we use for commercial production of vanilla. And so discovering the techniques for pollination was very important in order for us to have the vanilla industry. Uh, so uh, Madagascar, uh, the Philippines, any tropical country is now producing a lot of that vanilla. So here are the vanilla beans, which then you can put them in alcohol and extract some of the essence. Uh, the vanilla is not just a dry bean. It has to be kind of fermented to uh, bring out some of the, that, that flavoring that will then go into the organic extract that you use for uh, whatever you need. Uh, it is a climbing vine. Uh, it may begin its life as a terrestrial orchid, seeds germinating in, uh, on the ground, but as it climbs and gets to the top of the tree, uh, the base of the plant may rot away and then the plant will change into a completely epiphytic growth habit. Uh, but here's some uh, photograph of me finding vanilla orchid growing in the wild here climbing up a tree and here just creeping and crawling on top of the soil uh, from South America. Here's my very first uh, photograph, my very first encounter with vanilla orchid in the wild. This is in Brazil. So obviously I have to take a scale photography uh, so, uh, to memorize, commemorate this event because it was the first time that I got to see vanilla in the wild. And uh, you have uh, vanilla as probably the biggest botanical blunders that are out there. Uh, it's, vanilla is in a lot of products, but very few products actually have the real vanilla flower. Uh, so here's the vanilla. Here is vanilla growing everywhere. Uh, here's the actual flower, how they look. Uh, and here's the vanilla bean for the flavoring. But when you look at the magnification of that uh, coffee bean uh, uh, ice coffee, it does not have a vanilla flower. Here's vanilla flower. Here's some white flower with yellow. That's a nightshade. That's a tomato, potato. So they could not find a vanilla orchid to take this photograph. Oh, well. Uh, so that's a nightshade. Uh, but Coffee bean is not the only one that is uh, guilty of this. 
So here is a yogurt land that they're using just a generic Simvidium orchid. Uh, here is some kind of wafer that they're also using some kind of generic uh, Simvidium orchid. Here's a uh, yogurt, uh, very popular yogurt that is also using just a generic orchid. Uh, here's another yogurt with a different orchid. Uh, here's uh, more yogurt with an orchid. Uh, here's haagen ice cream with a dendrobium orchid uh, upside down. And here's a vanilla extract with a dendrobium orchid. Uh, here's a shampoo that is not even using an orchid, it's using a plumeria, uh, just to think uh, people that don't know the difference. And so I have yet to see a real vanilla flower used in any kind of those advertisements or products. And so here is one that I do not trust because it says it's all natural. However, the vanilla flower is fake, it's plastic. So I don't trust anything that has plastic, at least not for the photograph. So we'll get yet to see. Uh, Coffee Bee, uh, this is Starbucks and uh, Starbucks got the award for worse because they use a daffodil as their vanilla orchid representatives, which is not cool for Starbucks to use that. Uh, the other orchid that is used for food uh, is uh, orchis. It is a terrestrial orchid from the Middle East, uh, and it is used to thicken some of this ice cream. So this is the Middle Eastern ice cream that is very, very good if you never had a chance. And uh, so when I saw it and I read the ingredients, uh, it's an orchid plant. It's like, wow, I've never actually had it other than vanilla, uh, and so I must have it. And uh, it's great when you uh, mix it with some uh, Turkish bakalav, not the Greek. The Greek is horrible. Uh, the Turkish bakalav is the best. Uh, and so uh, here's uh, the vanilla, uh, the ice cream that is made with uh, the, uh, the two uh, suitable from that orchid, which is good and bad. It's a traditional food, uh, but people keep uh, taking it from the wild. And obviously there's gonna be a loss of population now that there's more humans. Uh, so here's the ice cream, and if you've never had it, it is very good if you get a chance. Uh, and there's uh, in the, between uh, some of the Turkish baklava. So this is heaven right here. Uh, so here's just a, a few more of uh, the terrestrial orchids that I happened to stumble upon uh, in my travels. So just at the bottom of the floor, here they are with the leaves and uh, some of the flowers uh, that are gonna be very, very showy. Uh, and some of the others that either we've grown here like our lady slippers. So these are also very popular. We may get to see them later on. So the lady slipper orchids or sometimes referred to as the bucket type because that's exactly what they're gonna do. Uh, the lip will form a bucket where water or exodus from the flower may be deposited to attract the bee or the pollinator. And so here are some photograph, if you ever get a chance to go to what I like to refer to as the orchid beauty pageant, these orchid shows that are throughout this area, maybe not right now, maybe they're gonna have a virtual uh, beauty pageant, uh, but you should do so because there's where a lot of the orchid geeks are gonna be displaying some of the most magnificent orchids that they have. Uh, so here's some of those orchids uh, or the lady slippers. Here's uh, Pragmipedulum, I think this, that's the name. Uh, this one grown in the wild in uh, Chiapas, Mexico. I uh, had to climb a little to get to it, but it was worth it. Yes. Uh, and here's in Colombia growing in the landscape. Uh, obviously this is not gonna happen here. This is a little bit hotter and nicer uh, but, and more humid, uh, but they, they look very nice as a landscape plant uh, right here. Uh, some of the cattleyas, so there's going to be plenty and many of them, uh, many, many different hybrids. Uh, we've seen one with a little bit of purple. Here's uh, the burgundy. This looks more like the ones we saw. And here's the cattleya beauty pageant uh, with a bunch of other orchids. And then the cymbidiums are going to be a terrestrial, probably one of the easiest orchids that most people can grow outdoors here. Here's the beauty pageant with uh, the many, many different colors and some with upright spikes, some with cascading spikes, you name it, they're out there. Uh, and then the moth orchids, 
Uh, the ones from Trader Joe's, very popular gift, no problem. Uh, and then here's the Jewel Orchid. Hopefully I'll be able to find them. I don't guarantee it. Uh, this one is from Indonesia, but the leaves are gonna be very shiny and that's why they're called Jewel Orchid. Uh, the flowers, okay, not that exciting, but the color of the leaf is definitely very, very, very nice. Uh, so there's a side view of the flower. Uh, some of the terrestrial ground orchids. So this is the Chinese ground orchid. So yes, you can grow some orchids outdoor here in Southern California in the sun uh, and they will flower. So this is uh, in our garden. So Chinese ground orchid that has now become a little bit big and when it's in flower, everybody wants it because they never seen a true orchid growing in the ground. And that's gonna be very important. Most of the orchids that we are gonna be dealing with cannot really grow in the ground. You have to double pot them, so keep them in the pot and put them in the ground. But this Chinese ground orchid is definitely planted like a regular landscape plant outdoors and it will do very, very well for us here. And it's still very attractive. Uh, this is a samurai orchid. And I had a student who uh, was an orchid fanatic a couple of years ago and he brought it so I can photograph and I guess in the old tradition of uh, the true samurais they had to have an orchid with them and caring for the orchid would bring discipline and a bunch of other benefits so that was very important to them so the samurai orchids right here and that's the face for it and then we have the epidendrum sometimes referred to as poor man orchid because they grow like weeds around here this would be another that you can get away with planting it in the ground or in large containers. And then you may come across this one, uh, which is kind of weird, uh, or sometimes referred to, this one is referred to as a bee orchid. Uh, and or in the wild, here's just a branch that fell from the tree. It had an orchid attached to it and it was also blooming. Uh, and I was able to take the photograph with the side view of uh, that flower. Uh, and just a tree in the tropics with moss, with bromeliads, with a lot of humidity. And uh, somewhere in there, there's uh, just an orchid growing, very small flowers, but there's a plant uh, with the flowers uh, in and amongst the rest of the vegetation. The same thing here, different view. Uh, here's the flowers for that. And here in the wild, it's just growing out of stumps, growing out of trees. Uh, with flowers or with fruits in this case, uh, or Ancidium pucellum, uh, the pretty orchid. Uh, here is a much bigger flower compared to uh, the size of uh, the pseudo stem uh, right there. Uh, just an orchid collection. Uh, there's a lot of people who has this. Uh, most of the tropical orchids will need some kind of greenhouse around here with lots of humidity, lots of good ventilation. And so this is uh, the orchid collection from the Los Angeles County Arboretum, or now LA uh, Botanic Garden, I think, LA County Arboretum. Uh, so I got a chance to do an internship there many years ago, and I got a chance to water some of these plants. Uh, most of them were donations from people that were uh, move on to a different world, and uh, their children then donated the plant to the Arboretum for caring and for displaying. And so I got a chance to water them and take uh, several photographs of the different uh, plants, orchids that they have in their collection there. And so it is not uncommon for botanic gardens to have collections of different orchids uh, that people may donate over the years. And so, but it's showing you just how diverse and some, how weird some of them may be, including this one that makes a kiki or an offshoot out of the pseudo bulb, uh, or this one, the award-winning one. Uh, some may look like grass, so there are such a thing as grass orchids, uh, so such as this, uh, or some of them that are gonna be displayed on a trunk in the beauty pageant, and or this one, also the award winner, uh, which uh, has uh, the pseudo bulb that kind of looks down or faces down like an umbrella, and out of that you have the flowers. Uh, so kind of weird, probably protecting the flowers from the rain. Uh, or uh, here's uh, some couple of uh, other uh, mandevilia, I think, maybe. Uh, right there. Uh, or uh, stanopia. 
Uh, this is from uh, Mexico into Central and South America. And uh, they were grown for many years. They were seen in the wild, but nobody could ever get them to flower in cultivation. Uh, and that is because they are known for having their flower spikes go down or grow down. And so when they were grown in a convenient container that was completely solid, the flowers never get a chance to go down. And so nobody ever saw them. It was until somebody did a blunder and they broke the pot and realized that there were a bunch of flower buds developing on the bottom. Then they started to cultivate them in a orchid basket. And that's what they're called. And that is allowing them to expose the flower and grow downward. And then finally, they realized the mistake that they were doing. So now people grow them. They are very, very nice, very different orchids. Uh, and so here they are at the conservatory at the Huntington Library. Uh, so many different forms, uh, Stanopia uh, orchids. Uh, or these are from Mexico. These are some of the uh, the orchids that I came across uh, in Mexico in the, my travels. Uh, some of them, like I mentioned, very tiny compared to uh, the more ornate ones that we have. Some of these ones that are kind of look like grassy, even they're just tiny. I really need a microscope to see uh, the detail of them all. And uh, the fruit. So I'm lucky when I ever I get to see the fruit to photograph it. And uh, here's one that I found uh, in Chiapas on a pine forest, high altitude. And here's where nature plants them on the side of the trunk. Uh, and so again, people may mount orchids on bark. People may mount them on stumps. And it's just mimicking, simulating what nature is done. So that is nature made uh, and people will try to imitate it. And we were able to photograph it. Uh, so that's an orchid that was growing there for many, many years. And you see the different pseudobulbs uh, as the plant has gotten bigger. So now it's getting to be there. Uh, and uh, it was flowering. So with flowers, there's going to be a lot more money. Uh, and that will retail for probably about $60 around here, if not more. Uh, a few more other weird uh, terrestrial orchids. Uh, this are, I think these are from Ecuador. And even this one here, uh, kind of blending in with uh, uh, the vegetation. Uh, this uh, is one that I found uh, coming down from the second highest mountain in Central America, uh, Volcan Tacana. And just in cultivation, if you're lucky, uh, in tropical areas, you can grow them outdoors, no problem here. There's a very selected few that can grow outdoors in the ground, uh, but here is, uh, uh, this very tall uh, bamboo orchid, or here's uh, another one that has very tiny flowers, but very, very big spikes. And just tied to the tree, they're going to be very, very happy and look very nice. Uh, so just uh, in a garden in Chiapas, Mexico, where I came across many of this, or now in the wild, once again, some kind of uh, moth orchid. Uh, this is in Cuba, so just growing uh, naturally on the stem of the bark of the palm. Uh, and this one's just the uh, same one there. Uh, and here you can see the roots as they are clinging to that palm. Uh, so with flowers. And then just growing on the ground, some of these uh, other uh, orchids also from Cuba, rinsing amongst the vegetation. Uh, and right next to this little ditch uh, was this terrestrial orchid uh, and uh, a very tiny one right here. You can see the flowers on the right and there's uh, where it's clinging to the plant and there's the flowers uh, for this individual uh, right there. And uh, in the botanic garden in Cuba, so they had it also growing on the trunk uh, or a piece of wood in simulating nature. Uh, and I was able to take some of these photographs from the ones that were flowering. Uh, and uh, another one right here in hiding from view, probably fell down from a tree. And that happens to be this one right here. And that one is growing there on the tree happily and flowering. Uh, and then there is a very weird group of uh, plants, orchids uh, from Ecuador primarily. Uh, these are going to be known as 
the monkey orchids. And so here's uh, my trip to Ecuador where we stayed, they had a few baskets and they were blooming. Uh, so here's the flower. And when you look very close at the face, it may look like a monkey. Uh, so here's uh, the eyes and there's the mouth and the teeth, um, like a bam baboon, I guess. And so these are very specialized and they only grow in uh, certain high altitudes. So Ecuador seems to be where they have been studied the most. Uh, so I was very happy when I got a chance to see them. So here's a different, so there were a couple of them that were blooming, uh, a couple of different, uh, it's a different monkey orchid. I did not get a chance to see them in the wild, uh, so this is as close as I got to see them. So there's a face of the monkey. Uh, and also, they also had this, some of the terrestrial uh, ones in the garden uh, right there. And just in the wild, going around looking for plants. So here's a terrestrial out of Ecuador. And uh, very, very nice. And there's the face of the orchid. And uh, this very, very long uh, pseudo cane, pseudo stem. Uh, here's a friend from uh, Germany, uh, Rebecca. Uh, she's posing, scaling for that big orchid. Uh, so here's very long. Uh, floral tube right there. There's a face uh, for this one and the fruit. So we're all able to see the fruit. And just a tree in the wild, farming on one side, left in the middle, covered with bromeliads, covered with orchids, covered with a bunch of either some of the epiphytic cacti. And so we came across uh, this uh, individual. Uh, and then uh, here's a different one that the pseudo stem looks almost like a heart. And right out of the center, you have the buds. And later on, we found a bunch that were in flower. And another terrestrial orchid right here uh, with uh, the pink flower almost looking like a grass or like a giant palm. And more here. From the wild, and these are the others that kind of have the heart shape. And uh, this one uh, with the kind of greenish flowers, a little bit of white. Uh, terrestrial. And I think I've now moved into Chiapas, Mexico, or maybe this is Colombia now, because that's not ah, Colombia. Uh, so there's uh, some of the orange ones that I, I came, uh, came across. Uh, those are most likely going to be pollinated by hummingbirds. Uh, and then this other very tiny one uh, right there with uh, very tiny flowers. And then uh, we have a beautiful rock covered with bromeliads next to this uh, river. And uh, what I said is like next to it, somebody brought down a tree or they brought a big branch and they simply scrape off all the epiphytic. So this is now trash. This is meant to die now. And what we found is a lot of orchids. Uh, so I happened to kind of scrunch through there, man, I found uh, this one. So once again, you feel tempted to bring them, save them, uh, but unfortunately you can't because you're not supposed to bring them out of there. I mean, you can put them back on a tree if you really feel sorry for them, uh, but there are no real value to these orchids in some of the native areas. They like the wood because they need to cook with it. Uh, and so here's another one just growing out of that bark of the tree. And then here's the flower cluster. And that happens to be another Oncidium uh, type or the common known as dancing doll. More epidendrum here in different colors. Uh, and then uh, here's uh, another weird one, terrestrial orchid. And even this one with more flowers and somebody broke uh, the pseudo stem. And some more here and not very showy, but they're out there. And another very tall, kind of greenish, most likely pollinated by some moth or something else. And there's a face of the flower. Uh, and with aroids, you have orchids. With bromeliads, you have orchids. And they're going to be good companions for almost any uh, plant. And so here's just other species that we keep finding as we keep on exploring in the natural area. I think this is now going back to Colombia. Um, and seeing some of this very weird with the fruit. And the fruit is sometimes very difficult to find. So there's the fruit uh, for it. 
and then uh, this one that looks almost like a dancing ba baller ballerina and uh, there's a uh, face view and there's a close-up of it uh, and just in uh, ecuador just probably rescue from uh, the forest either they fell uh, but they are just keeping them alive and as the night came that's when we came across this one and photograph is bad because now my camera is not able to take good photographs uh, in cultivation growing on a guava uh, and uh, in the paramo or the high altitudes uh, you have a few that can even survive a little bit of cold in the afternoon and I have a few of them I have ID uh, but not many of them uh, and then uh, in this place uh, they rescue many of them as they were building some of the roads and they're are growing with flowers and I spend a lot of hours uh, just going through every single one and photographing this, uh, this uh, rescue orchid and that's the genus Stelis if you wanted to know because uh, it's, it's going to be very diverse and very large so just rescue from Colombia And this is a genus Pleurothalis. And so here's a few more. And some of the fruit and the flower. And get every turn, everywhere we saw, we saw something new, something with flower. And so this is a genus Lepanthes. Uh, if you were interested, uh, but you've probably seen a lot more orchids than many people have seen in their life with some of these photographs. And so from the cultivation, the ones that were rescued, then when we started hiking, uh, then we saw them growing everywhere. And if there was a place that I could say it was covered with orchids like weeds, it would be Colombia, because this is uh, where I found them on every single branch on the ground. Everywhere we turn, there would be orchids. And some of them, including some of these ones with the fruit uh, that had a few flowers. Uh, so here's just a trail, some of the larger brush, and here you see orchids growing like every other shrub. Uh, so there's a photograph close up of that. So yeah, can orchid become a weed or grow like weeds? Yes, they can. Uh, so that's Epidendra mortici from Ecuador, sorry, from Colombia. Uh, and uh, here's one that looks like a monkey, uh, like a mouse, uh, Pontieva. Uh, and there's a different species of that one, a different photograph. Uh, and then uh, this one here that hangs with this kind of chocolate, I guess I don't have a better photograph, maybe later on. So just a trail, walking, finding more orchids along the trail. It's just kind of in your face. So here's uh, the reserve, uh, already damaged, being restored. Uh, but that's the story with uh, Colombia that they have destroyed about 90 to 95 percent of their natural uh, vegetation and some of the few pockets that are remain do have a, still a good diversity so hopefully they'll continue on saving uh, some of this. Uh, this one is not, not normally pollinated by butterflies and this is the genus uh, Comparetia uh, and uh, so there's a uh, as we keep walking, more Pleurothalus. Uh, and if I had to find, say, where was the most beautiful place that I've seen, uh, they had to be this. Uh, this is in Colombia, uh, north side of Bogota. And we kind of had to be making our own road to go meander through the vegetation. Uh, and uh, yeah, it was water, it was tree ferns everywhere. Uh, it was high vegetation. Uh, there were even some oaks uh, and uh, many orchids uh, that we found along the way. Uh, so that's uh, Stigmostalix. Uh, and here's a couple more, just some of them with flowers, some of them not open. And uh, Maxillaria. And here's another Epidendrum. Uh, this one. And this tiny yellow one here, side view and the face view, uh, and another pollinated, uh, pollinated by butterflies. Uh, this one is Comparetia falcata, and here's a different one with photographs. 
So uh, to keep walking, you may see a couple of other plants. Hopefully they'll synchronize the flower. And then uh, the other one uh, uh, is gonna be a lithophytic. So this one is growing on top of a rock and many orchids will do that. Uh, so you see the rock in the middle and on top of it, you have that big orchid. Uh, so I had to go up there and try to photograph it. Uh, and here's uh, some of the photographs. I think I have a better one. This is a top of Elianthus. Uh, and so here's the typical view in Colombia. So lots of cattle and some of the forest that is not pristine because they have already taken a lot of the good rare wood uh, and they just left a couple of the other weedy individuals and there's uh, some of the orchids uh, that we came across uh, throughout that area and one that almost behaves like a climbing individual so has a come like a climbing pseudostem another terrestrial with very tiny uh, flowers right there and there's a close-up of those and that's a protonus rusifolia and I think this is a better photograph of the other uh, one that I showed you before. Uh, and that is another Elianthus. And then uh, another Stelis and a yellow one, uh, Maxillaria. And this one that looks like it has a big nose uh, right there. And uh, the uh, iconic uh, or the national flower of uh, Colombia is uh, a cattleya. So here it is growing on top of trees, flowering. Uh, most people will harvest them because they're that easy and they're plentiful. Uh, so that's uh, the national flower of Colombia. Uh, and here's where people either rescue them or pillage them from the trees and they just put them in a basket and that's where they're growing them. Uh, and uh, here's some of the yellows and the orange. And this one that I mentioned, it also behaves like a vine. So very long pseudostem. So it will kind of cling and climb over other plants. And that's how it'll get to the top uh, and a few others. Another terrestrial here uh, with the, some of the close ups and some more tiny with fruits. Uh, and there's another of the grass looking thing, grass looking orchid and another kind of brownish colorful one another yellow and uh, this one that we found also very high altitude most likely is going to be pollinated by a hummingbird so this will be my example of a hummingbird pollinated so almost forms like a tube no landing platform kind of orangey reddish uh, so we've seen butterfly, hummingbird, and also most of the other ones will be bees. Uh, so this one is in Colombia, and I had a chance to go with uh, the orchid expert uh, in Colombia, and it was kind of nice because I was able to pick orchids and not feel guilty because he was recording, and we may have found a few other individuals that he was never recorded. So there's Colombia uh, with me holding some of these orchids. Uh, and uh, if we go and jump just briefly to California, this is uh, Piperia. This is the California ground orchid. Uh, and here it is growing in Catalina Island. Uh, so it's not very interesting. And most often people don't realize that it's an orchid because it kind of grows and looks like a grass. Uh, but here is one flower spike. Here's another and another. And another. Uh, and here I showed you how just it looks when you see it with the, and amongst the vegetation, very well camouflaged. Here it is by itself. And here is the close up of that flower. So if you're out hiking Catalina, if you're hiking Santa Monica's or throughout California, keep your eyes open for this orchid. It's cryptic. I'm still trying to find it in Griffith Park and I have failed miserably so far, but I'm still looking. Uh, or Epipactus, this is the stream orchid. So if you happen to find a river with perennial water, look in the water and uh, you may find this one. Uh, here I took a photograph from uh, it in cultivation being offered for sale uh, by Tree of Life. So this will be another very popular California uh, orchid, uh, so stream orchid. 
Uh, and with that, I will end it. And I think we had a ORCID overload. So any questions? Probably more ORCIDs than you ever wanted to see. Ah, that's a lot of ORCIDs. <laughs> <laughs> and that's not even uh, touching, that's only South America, one or two trips in South America. Uh, <laughs> All right, then uh, I'll bid you farewell. Let me start recording. And I'll